Okay, then we are recording the inaugural value metrics working group meeting on March 29. Here we go. Right on. Woohoo. Um, all right, well, um, I'm not leading this one, so. <laughs> Why not? Because I lead a lot of other ones. <laughs> I'm tired of not leading some of them. <laughs> <clears throat> so I shared out the meeting minutes with the agenda. Yep. Go for it, Andy. Okay, I'll, I'll uh, read it. Uh, let's see. Uh, is it your practice to appoint a note taker for these calls? It is. Yes. Okay, any volunteers? I'm happy to do it. Okay, that sounds good. Sometimes we um, also just kind of do it by committee. Mm -hmm. Many people editing. Yeah. yeah. Okay, why don't we, uh, let's just go right down the agenda then. Let's talk about this uh, submission, this, this proposal for a birds of a feather session. Mm -hmm. I just posted the link. I just added my name to it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you. <laughs> Good job, John. Thanks. Uh, I know how to self-interest myself. That's great. <laughs> uh, so I, I think it's. Uh, I think the text is wonderful. If if everyone is amenable, I will post this. If if people want to talk about the text, then let's do it now. Nope, this looks good to me. I mean, I saw it earlier. There's another paragraph that you're going to have to include. I think, which is why this issue is important. Okay. Should I'm guessing. We, okay, should we do this before we send it in? Um, I, yeah, I think. So basically, um, it's, it's really, I think it's pretty straightforward. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. Sean's writing it right now. Okay. Open source projects are becoming increasingly important. Understanding the health of these projects is becoming critical for organizations. Value plays a key role in understanding health, period. <laughs> So something along those lines. Yes. Okay. And I think it's more, it's a, it's a comment field for the Linux foundation more so just in case there is somebody submitting something that seems a little out of band. They just want to get their head around what it is. Yep. I'm going to blame Nicole on that one. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. All right, um, I'm, not, I'm not in love with my sentence there, but I was trying to help. That's very helpful. I'll probably just take one pass for grammar for <clears throat> yeah. this afternoon. Thank you, Sean. Sure. I think it's that, that dual sides of the labor investment and the, the sort of market valuation, ecosystem valuation that's central from things I've heard people say, and you probably yeah. agree with that to some degree. Probably more. So one thing I'll say is, um, as I've been talking about this, when, when talking about, you know, kind of the, the core sort of social good that this can deliver, I usually express it in terms of, you know, trying to set up the environment with metrics that would allow people, that would allow companies to expand the open source workforce so that people can can make a living wage through open source. So that's how I've been thinking about it. And um, if that's not, if you guys have got a different way that you'd like to express that, um, you know, I'm all ears, but, but that's, that's how I've been thinking about it to this point. My guess is that it can be, <clears throat> excuse me, it can be expressed in a kind of a variety of different ways. Mm -hmm. and, and I think we can think about those as our focus areas. Okay. And so um, that what you're talking about, Andy, I think would constitute one of the focus areas. Okay. Other other uh, ideas for different focus areas? Why don't we, in the in the document, Andy, could you express that focus area like in a couple words? <clears throat> okay, in the in the meeting notes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Sounds good. Uh, Sean, you had expressed something as well. 
Um, yeah, I think there's, there's two dimensions that I think are measurable with metrics pretty easily. Um, and I can like your type them. Um, one is the estimating the labor investment associated with open source projects through source code analysis, issue analysis and other kinds of things. <clears throat> and then the other is uh, assessments of the eco, I would call it ecosystem value, which is really a, uh, sort of a one layer of indirection away from something like market valuation, where, for example, I mean, this is a classic, or not classic, but Kubernetes has a significant amount of labor investment, but it also has a significant market valuation and that market valuation to the ecosystem of open sources. At this point, since so much pivots off of Kubernetes and the Linux Foundation, I would say that's a, that market valuation is probably more important even than the significant labor investment. And so sometimes projects can, you know, like a tech company take off and recognizing or trying to estimate those values, I think has utility. And, you know, so there might be two ways of expressing this ecosystem value. You know, yeah. one might be, hey, if you, could, if you could own and control this whole ecosystem as a company, and then you were to, you know, put this company up for sale, you know, in an M&A deal, like what would the value be? And you know, for, for Kubernetes, it would be very, very high. Yeah. And maybe another way to express the ecosystem value is, you know, if you are a company like Facebook that mm -hmm. has got this React ecosystem and um, you, you wanted to control, you wanted to transfer sort of the, the sponsorship of this React, React ecosystem to another company maybe in exchange for some sort of, uh, you know, financial value, what would that value be? So I, I can see, I think both of those would be interesting numbers. Mm -hmm. I agree completely. <clears throat> All right. So looking at this document, we kind of have five. Is that right? Kind of out of the gate. I think so. Okay. I think I summarized what George, uh, what uh, Andy said as market valuation and enterprise valuation. Mm -hmm. Okay. Are those, does that capture the essence of what you were explaining? It's good shorthand. Yeah. It's, you can change it later. Okay. So w one thing that, that kind of strikes me, um, <clears throat> you know, I think it'll be useful to, to be able to express to ourselves and, and to, you know, people who are interested in this project, why should companies and why should contributors be interested in these value metrics? Mm -hmm. And so, okay, so I gave, I gave one hypothesis why they should be interested is is that for the for the labor force you know potentially these metrics will will help to shape the ecosystem in such a way that it expands opportunities for people to make a living wage in open source and maybe there are maybe we can think of reasons why companies would be interested in these value metrics and um, I think those reasons kind of center around company competitiveness, being able to innovate faster. Uh, I think they would be interested in um, building up brand value. So there's, a, there's brand value associated with um, having a successful open source project attached to your organization. <clears throat> yes. Recruiting, th things of that nature. Georg, you're cranking it out. It's just great. Yeah. To, it's great to be able to just talk and see the words appear. He's a note-taking machine. Man, this is awesome. <clears throat> is that German? <laughs> yes, it does. <laughs> it helps, helps to speed up the... It helps to speed up the uh, typing, then we'll take German. 
Uh, you know, and, and the other thing is <clears throat> you, could even, you could even break down the why do I care uh, motivations um, by stakeholder role. And in our, um, <clears throat> in our uh, sort of working group proposal, uh, you know, we attempted to do a little bit of market segmentation and we identified four roles. Uh, one is sponsor. One is, uh, and, and sponsor would be something like a CIO in a company, you know, somebody who would allocate budget and mm -hmm. somebody who would, um, let's say, endorse the decision to create an, an open source program office within a company that would be a sponsor role. Another role would be a maintainer, which could either be a project maintainer or the person who is um, the leader of an open source pro program office. That, so that'd be another role in this segmentation. And then the other one would be the contributor, which we know that role super well. And the final role would be the role of the user of the software. You know, they're gonna, they're gonna have um, a say in, in all of this. And so when we think about when we think about motivations and when we think about the why do I care question, uh, I think it's going to be s super useful to break it down by role because different roles are going to have different motivations. Agree. <clears throat> yeah, agreed. <laughs> okay. I mean, I think from a, when I think about it from a contributor point of view, if I'm a contributor and I have mad Python skills, if I can contribute to Kubernetes and become a central person there, that I think has more value for my potential income in the long run than contributing to some fringe project that doesn't have a lot of enterprise or market valuation. So I think from a contributor's perspective, there's a direct tie between value and what they can likely get by becoming a central contributor in terms of compensation. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And, and so I don't know how we express that in a non tacky way. Um, the way you said it was fine because it's just true. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's just, true. that's right. Yeah. Yeah. You could probably think about strategies for, for why contributors would attach themselves to projects and, um, you know, one strategy is, you know, I need to put food in the fridge and um, what can, and I need to pay my rent. You know, what's the fastest path to that? And another strategy might be, hey, I'm, I'm interested in just learning. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so, so within the contributor world, there can be different you know, segments of people who have different motivations. So, yeah, yeah, I think also this, some of this kind of assumes that the contributors have a choice. I think there are situations where contributors are really kind of compelled by their organizations mm -hmm. to work on particular projects. Right. right. Yeah. And, and I think maybe that's where some of the con contributor working on open source projects that they're not paid for while they're working on projects that they are paid for. So mm -hmm. if I'm maintaining something that isn't very sexy um, or current, but it's essential because my company wants me to, I may go off and become a contributor to something like Kubernetes or, or a project that is emerging because mm -hmm. I'm looking to increase my value in the marketplace. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and I think, I think that probably motivates a lot of the not employer sponsored participation from people who get paid to do open source. Right. All right. Well, this is really good. I think this is a good first talk through things here. Yep, we're really uh, putting the pressure on Georg here. He seems to be holding up. Pretty. Yeah, he's killing it. I have uh, not been paying attention. I was looking through the old metrics that we had in the value <laughs> category, and I've just added them to our focus areas. So oh, you're yeah, trying to just talked about. Yeah, I'm mapping them. Okay. So from, from my perspective, um, you just trying to articulate what these focus areas is a great first step. And then I think there's going to be things 
obviously under the hood of these focus areas, which are what, what's the goal associated? This is the goal question metric. So if I just picked expanding opportunities for people to make a living wage, mm-hmm. um, you know, what's the, what's the goal of this focus area? <clears throat> um, and then underneath there, what questions do we need to answer to kind of satisfy, right? right? And some of these might be goals in themselves. Um, what questions do we need to, to, to perhaps satisfy our understanding of that goal? So if the goal is to expand opportunities for people to make a living wage, a question wouldn't be, you know, what's the current cost of milk? That wouldn't, that wouldn't matter. That's not a question that needs to be answered. So what are the questions that we need to answer to address that goal? And typically those questions, I don't know, there's maybe half a dozen to 10 questions. And, and, and like I think I've told you before, Andy, we're always trying to just kind of move this forward. So this doesn't have to be, you know, the single canonical list right out of the gate. Oh, oh for sure. This is yeah. a pretty good canonical list though, if I wanted to. Well, I was thinking like the questions, like for the, for the focus areas, the questions, there might be six or 10, but we may only come up with four right out of the gate. Oh yeah. Um, and then for those questions, what would be the metrics that we would need to observe to provide evidence? Yes. That's it. Right. I don't know that we need to do all that right now. We could. Right. This is a great starting point. This is a great starting point. Um, I tried to do what we just, what you just described, Matt, in the first one. Okay. Uh, expanding opportunities for people to make a living wage in open source as a goal. One of the questions could be how much can people earn who work on this project? And then a metric could be number of commercial offerings around this project where people can earn or average pay for jobs that require this project as a goal. Yep. This is a good example. I think my, my thought is, is that from these focus areas, which I, I agree with Sean, they're a great list. Uh, I think these could be easily shared to the chaos list mm-hmm. starting point. I would suspect if we shared the <laughs> the focus areas, goals, questions, and metrics in one fail swoop, it would be a bit too much to consume. Yep. And then one thing we can do is separate out the goals into different issues. And each issue is tied to a Google Doc where we develop the goals with respective questions. So if someone wants to contribute to a specific goal, by having an issue with a Google Doc, they can just go there and start contributing. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. John, what do you think based on the way? I think that's the way to go. Yeah, yeah, for sure. We don't want, I mean, I think we've got a really good list here and getting outside feedback from others and chaos is a good idea, right? Mm -hmm. These mechanisms that you've suggested are perfect. Cool. So we have one, two, three, four, five. Okay. So we have an action item to create an issue with the Google Doc for each goal and share the list of goals with goals slash focus areas with the chaos mailing list. Mm-hmm. I think so. Yeah. I can do that unless someone else wants to. <laughs> I don't I, I don't think it would ever happen in the history of the world that someone would chime in to do something and <laughs> others would wrestle you for it. No. So well. <laughs> Plus, yeah. Are you thinking of something where it might well, be like, you know, like to be you know, like to have to be drunk with power and have lots of that? <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, sure. not in a service role. 
Well, actually, I think there might be a few things, Sean, you might offer to do that I'm like, actually, no, I'll do that. Yeah. <laughs> no, right. I'm just kidding. No, no, no. <laughs> you wouldn't send me as a diplomatic attache to... That's right. I'll, I'll actually, I'll take care of that for you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I have a... I've got a question for all of you, uh, which is just your your vision and and you know how do you see these ideas sort of translating into um, things that can things that people can consume, either the ideas with which are just the metrics or maybe they're implemented in software or you know maybe there's. Uh, some sort of an analytics tool that people can use. Uh, so sometimes, you know, as a, as a newcomer, I've, I've seen uh, in some situations people say, hey, we're just going to publish a list of metrics and we're agnostic as to how they actually get implemented. And in other ways, I've actually seen, you know, some really nice tools that people have built. Uh, so I'm just curious. Um, you know, so we've got these, we've got these goals and, you know, I can envision ways that you could like analyze a GitHub repo and an issue tracker, mm -hmm. you know, to come up with some sort of evaluation, you know, based on average labor costs and things like that. Mm -hmm. how, that. how do you see it shaking out? So, um, first of all, I think, I think we can define the metrics agnostically in a similar way to the way that we've done it in the other working groups. I think, I think the exercise of writing it down, it's like in software, it, you do it well if you've taken a minute to decide what your design is gonna be, mm -hmm. and, and those definitions can drive design. But I also think it can work in the other direction where we build a tool and see what sort of information we can get out of it and then reverse engineer a metric around that. Mm -hmm. In Augur, we're looking to integrate right now, or actually I've got a developer working on right now, integrating a project called SCC, which is a source code clock counter. Um, so it looks at lines of code involved. And then there's an implementation of Kokomo that actually uh, is derived from David Wheeler's uh, decade ago implementation of Kokomo. <clears throat> so you look at code complexity and it actually mm -hmm. outputs it all puts about, you know, evaluation numbers, like what would be the effort level to, to put this into place? I think when it's, so that I'll you know, breathe now. So that's really cool. It's almost like a reverse engineering, you know, mm -hmm. in, you know, reverse estimating. Mm -hmm. if you will. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I mean, you've probably looked at Kokomo or at least heard about it. I have not. So it, it comes out of actually um, Barry Bames software engineering work in the nineties at USC. Mm. And, you know, it's not, it hasn't, I've been looking around GitHub, there haven't been, there's not a substantial project that I can find that implements it other than this SCC one, which is extremely active and has a lot of, uh, it seems mind share around it. So um, I think it's, I think it's a way to go. It certainly is something that we're going to, we're experimenting with actively right now to see what an integration would look like. And kind of the way I always, the way that I've, the way that we're thinking about doing these things is on a repository by repository basis. So unlike some things, like when you're looking at commits, you can look at commits as they emerge over time. I think code complexity, I don't think there's a need to look at the evolution of code complexity. You're waving? I have to go. Okay. okay. It's good to see you. I just, I have another meeting. I have to try. Oh, no, 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 no worries. Um, I didn't know what the wave was, so. Um, yeah, so there's ways to look at code complexity. Um, I think we just want to look at point in time estimations. I, in most projects, unless they're evolving rapidly, they're not going to change, but we could, I could conceive of storing snapshots. So, I mean, some metrics are, have a temporal dimension organically, and I think the temporal dimension for code complexity might be, if, it ha if there is one, it, it occurs over substantially bigger periods of time. Mm -hmm. Right. Like, I don't care about the weekly evolution of code complexity. Right. <clears throat> At least when I have no view into any of it right now. So, so if I could um, sort of restate what I, mm -hmm. what I heard, um, <clears throat> there's kind of, it, 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 uh, it's like what we're trying to produce as an outcome is 
uh, like in two levels. Okay, at the simplest level, it's a list of metrics. And I would almost interpret what you told me is, you know, a list of metrics could almost, could almost take the form of a requirement spec. Mm -hmm. you no, know, when, you, when you implement this list of metrics, here are the things that it needs to do. It needs to answer this question, it needs to answer that question, that mm -hmm. sort of thing. And it's then, like an actor goal list almost. Yeah. You can think of it that way. Right. And mm -hmm. then, um, and then the, the second level thing is software implementations, mm -hmm. which, which may serve to actually be like real usable things that people can use or, or maybe the software implementation is done as a learning exercise because you, you right. learn so much, you know, actually by getting hands on and cranking out the code, you know, you gain new right. insights that, that you wouldn't have without doing that. Right. Okay. And I tried to capture that in the meeting minutes. Okay. Um, so that's all. I think that's mostly what we had on our agenda. Yeah. We have a whole other hour, half hours allotted for this, uh, Andy, <laughs> if you want to hang out and talk value, but I think we might be done. Maybe so. One of the questions you had, Andy, was how do these working groups work and how do we, how do, we do things? Is, it, is all that already answered? Because now would be a good time to answer these questions. Well, let's see. Um, <clears throat> so I think, you know, it's, it's kind of an interesting time for me right now because I'm a newbie. And, you know, I haven't been exposed to chaos before. And so... Um, Hopefully you've been immunized. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, so that, that was something that was a little bit unclear as to, you know, what actually does chaos produce? Mm -hmm. And so, I, so my answer right now in my head is chaos produces metrics, which, which sort of look and feel like a requirement spec. Mm -hmm. And then software implementations, you know, either as a real working tool or as a learning exercise. Yeah. And um, so, in, um, so I just add one thing in the growth maturity and decline working group, which is going to be the working group formerly known as growth maturity and decline at some point, maybe we'll use a symbol. Um, it's a print solution. We had Jupyter notebooks that we built against data that we gathered to do demonstration implementations of the metrics. And the, yeah, of course the advantage of those is that you can just throw some data together, build a notebook and show pretty plainly the logic, usually in Python, of how right. we might operationalize that metric. And then tool builders who mostly use Python anyway, can <coughs> you know, start with that code in their own tooling. I don't have to install something as complex as Augur or Grimoire Lab to right. start playing with it. Um, obviously, with Augur, we're, we're working toward being a, a more of a prototyping tool, and, and that's what we are. But I think that our, we, haven't, we haven't generated a ton of prototyping through the community yet, but I think part of that is um, there's, reason, there's, there's reasons for that. We've prototyped a lot of metrics, though, um, right. in a public way. Uh, mm -hmm. and actually, there is a – I know Matt said you actually installed it. Oh, I did, yeah. Yep. Uh, got it running on a virtual machine and you know went through the whole thing yeah uh, so actually um, uh, you know as a newbie that's that's another uh, sort of reaction I have so I got I got auger installed um, I looked at Greenmore labs um, Actually, I installed Percival. Yeah, Percival's a great tool with ga gathering stuff. You know, my my impre my initial impression looking all at all this stuff is, man, this is like a real disparate hodgepodge of of stuff. You know, there's there's like virtual machines, there's Python scripts, there's just mm -hmm. you know, it's like a it's like a shotgun blast, you know, without um, sort of a unifying theme. 
Uh, but when I looked at Percival, I thought, oh my God, this is actually, this actually has like real, like solid potential to be actually useful. Mm -hmm. And, um, but, but then when I dug into it a little bit more, um, there were things that I didn't quite understand. And I thought, man, it would really be great if there was like some, some learning materials or documentation, or if there was, if there could be, if I could like get connected with a mentor you know, who could teach me about Percival. Uh, so um, so my, my feedback as a newbie might be, oh, it might be useful just to think about the consumability of this, of this tool, of this tool set for um, newbies. Jupyter Notebooks might be, might be just perfect. Yep. I, I agree that the, consumability isn't isn't uh, ideal uh, well you know there's a, it looks to me like there's a really nice sort of critical mass of stuff yeah I, yeah. I mean and what we're trying to do with auger is, is simplify the consumability but we haven't reached a point where we have something like Percival's a pretty sweet tight little tool right um, I've used it for gathering mailing lists and find it super effective um, yeah easy to use uh, so the, the design seems really nice like it, it ought to be pretty easily extensible yeah and um, you know just a really nice framework yeah there's a there's a tool we're building into auger called facade that Brian Warner who's now back at the Linux Foundation developed and it does a really nice job of, of mining all the commits out of a github repo or mm -hmm. any any git repo and that one of the reasons that we're using it is because with Percival, that data, I can't remember if it's Percival or Sorting, Sorting Hat does the username recognition or mm -hmm. mapping, but but uh, they put everything in an elastic search database, which makes it actually harder to consume from a mm -hmm. producing a metric perspective. So the, the labor is sort of not on the front end, the labor is on the back end, where you're building something and you want to consume that data. Um, what what I like, or one of the reasons we've chosen facade is it does all the work of counting things up front. And so then I'm really just writing SQL queries to produce data on the back end. And, right. um, and that link that I put in the thing for, that's our chaos organization um, instance of uh, a front end auger for facade. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> mm -hmm. uh, the other thing that, um, I had a look at was a, a metrics tool that was was written by a guy. You know, he's I think maybe he's in Germany or Poland or something like that. Mm -hmm. for, I sorry, <clears throat> that sounds that sounds right. He he wrote a an analytic tool for cloud native. And um, what's it called? Here, Bluefish. No, no, Lukas is the guy who built it. Um, I'm trying to think what the tool is. Uh, but it, it looked to me like um, he like the he down there is a repo which is which which has a record of every commit and every issue in all of GitHub. And so it looked to me like he pulled from that and he, and he, he uh, you know, did sort of a data cleanup phase and he put it into um, Postgres. Better technology choice than MySQL. That's, uh, do you have a link for that repo, Andy? Oh, let's find it. Let's find it. Um, yeah, the CNCF dev stats for Kubernetes is also, which you. Oh, so is, is he the person that built that? I, I, th I think Lucas is the one who built it. He was at our first uh, Chaos Con. One of the um, challenges with that, that is a, that tool, and I, I, it's, it's elegant, it's beautiful. Um, it seems to have a lot of things in it that are specialized for the scale of a project like Kubernetes. Yeah. So, um, like, I don't really need to know the hourly commits. <laughs> right. Uh, and most people don't. And then the Kubernetes apparently has a, just a ton of bots doing work and uh, it shows the bot work. And I mean, it's a very cool tool. I just, other than Kubernetes, I don't know of a project that 
I would need all that for. Well, to me, yeah. to me, the thing that was the biggest eye opener <clears throat> was that there was a repo out there that, that just had in one location all of the, all the issue history and all the commit history. Really? For all of GitHub. What? You're talking about Git Archive? I don't, I, I gotta, I gotta look it up and, and I might be wrong. You know, maybe I, maybe my initial impression was, was uh, incorrect. But if I'm, if I'm right, that could be a really nice resource. Uh, where is it? <clears throat> Since we have some extra time, let's look it up. Okay, Lucas. Yeah. Is he the one that? That's the guy. L U K A S Z. I'm not not really. Yep. That's the one that you were posted. I just posted a link to GH Archive, which is the one I was thinking of, and you said it has everything from GitHub. Mm. Um, it's ba they basically are storing an archive of the entire GitHub timeline. Yeah which is, is, you know, one way to get all of the stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I'm having a hard time finding this thing. Uh, okay, there he is. Dev stats. Oh, maybe that's it. Yeah, that's it. Okay. It's dot devstats dot cnc. So that yeah, Georg put that link. There's a link in the the devstats one. Is is that the one you were thinking of? Yeah, that's what that's what I saw. Okay. And, and the thing that yeah, the thing that I thought was really cool about this, it's I mean, it's really a nice implementation that he's done. But the thing that really struck me was, oh, there's this repo out there that just has all of the raw data. Oh, here it is. GitHub archives. Yeah, GH archive. That's it. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry for being so dense here. They're not being dense at all. But this might be an awesome resource. You know, maybe this is something that we could use. Um, and it is. It's it's been mentioned as a data source by others before. It's not it's not as complete as the GitHub API I GitHub see. stuff, I see. and it's not as so. If you, and it's if you wanted to do like a counting of everything in a repository and a reconciliation of the names, mm -hmm. so far I've not found it. Just, there's too many API calls, so I found it far easier to clone the GitHub repo and then just go through it locally with Git yeah. commands. I think I'm not saying that is canonically the way that it has to happen. I'm just sort of, I'm saying that with GH, with the GH archive, there are, if you want to do things at scale, like more, for more than a half dozen or a dozen repos, then it, it's a lot of, a lot of API calls. Gotcha. But that's not, that's not to say that there's not a ton of value in here, because I think that there is. Gotcha. So maybe there are some, Maybe there's something else uh, that we could we could chat about. Um, and I've already talked with with Georg and, and Matt about this, but but not you, Sean. And and that is one of the things I'd like to do. I plan to do is is to put together um, a kind of an interview uh, program. Okay. So in in my view of, of, about value metrics. Um, I think there's two kinds of value metrics that would be useful. One are what I call public metrics. Mm -hmm. Okay, and this is what we're talking about now, you know, being able to parse a GitHub repo and do some analytics and some projection and, and come up with, with, with metrics that 
are, are sourced from publicly available data. Mm -hmm. um, the other type of metric that I, value metric that I think would be very interesting to be able to get hands on would be confidential metrics. And these are, these would be things like um, salaries, um, mm -hmm. marketing data, recruiting data, recruiting timelines, thing, things mm -hmm. of that nature. And um, so I've done, I've done quite a lot of uh, work in, in past lives, you know, doing things like that. Okay. So I've, I've done, um, you know, for, for a uh, new product, uh, market validation, you know, to figure out product market fit. You know, mm -hmm. I've, I've done exercises, you know, where we've gone out and interviewed, you know, potential customers, mm -hmm. tell them, give them a proposition, see if it resonates or not, see what, what key performance metrics they're using to drive their own business that, that, you know, would, would be relevant. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's one context where I've done that kind of thing. And then the other context is that at, a uh, you know, in strategy consulting engagements, you know, we've done exercises where we've gone out and done benchmarking for like an industry sector. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we would go to, we would go to a firm and say, Hey, you know, we're doing benchmarking on this particular question. Uh, we're going to be talking with, you know, a certain number of your peers. Mm -hmm. And we would like to collect confidential data from you. And in return, what you'll get is, is access to anonymized uh, results. And you'll, you'll be able to know where you fall, you know, where your metrics fall, you know, within your peers in, in such a way that everything is anonymized. So you can't point to, you know, any one company and, you know, really drill down on what they're up to. Yeah, I think I think um, that would be a value. That would be valued as a that'd be that'd be very valued. I think. Do you imagine a way that that's something that could be shared broadly in a community, or would that be something that would be built on top of some of the metrics that we define as a as a service offering, almost? Because I'm, just, I'm trying to get that that bridge of trust. Like <laughs> people don't want to. I think the, the definitions will be well received universally. Yeah. The data that you describe, I think that'd be a value add that individuals like you could put on top of it that yes. would, could point back to chaos and say, well, I'm doing this in a standard way. Um, well, I think, I think there's sort of two things that can emerge from that type of an exercise. One is what questions do people really care about? Yeah, that's an excellent point. And, and that, is, that is something that I think ought to be shareable publicly. You know? I, think, yeah, I think so. You know, we've gone out and we've talked with a dozen open source program offices. Um, what we learned is here's what they really care about. You know, here's the thing that's most important. I, I think that is, that would be very valuable. And then, and then the other thing is, you know, the actual numbers and the numbers, um, you know, it, it kind of depends on what we learn. I mean, there's, there's going to be a big discovery process in terms of how sensitive are people about this information? Mm -hmm. And, you know, like how secure are they in their jobs? You know, do, do they feel like, like they've got really solid backing and they can be open or is it a little bit? Not that you know, way. <laughs> um, is a little bit not that way and they're more sensitive to it. So I'm not sure what we would find, you know, when we start talking with people and it would be done sort of iterative, iteratively, you know, like there might be a phase one where we say, hey, let's, you know, can you even talk to us about this? Right. And we might find people say, no, hey, you know, <laughs> not, you know. Not going to happen. Not going to happen. Um, uh, or they might say, yeah, I can talk to you about it. Hey, we're experimental, you know, we're getting stuff up and running. You know, we really want to come at this with an open mind and, and you know, we're really open to it. So, we could find either attitude. I, I, I don't know what we would find, but I think either in either case, it'd be an interesting thing to know. For sure. <clears throat> so, um, so just, just to FYI, that's, that's another sort of thing we've been talking about. And, um, no, that, that sounds really exciting actually as a, as an area of inquiry. Yeah. Cause I think, I think you're right. People knowing those questions, 
that, that are important. And, and I think you'd have some open source project managers, office directors, whatever, that, that would be very clear about what questions they wanted to get of others who would be kind of more trying to figure it out. And right. the intersection of those different sets of considerations, I think is going to give you a pretty full view. Uh, and yeah. if, those, if those questions are then operationalized around the goals, question, metrics, framework inside of chaos's value working group, then now you have something that is really valuable. There's my daughter. Yeah. Hey, all right. <laughs> Great looking kid. Yeah. Isn't she? Come on in and introduce yourself. Come on and introduce yourself, Edie. Yeah, yeah. I just call you my daughter. I don't. She says I don't like you. Know, <laughs> she's technically my stepdaughter, but you know I don't embarrass her with that. Okay, we'll just refer to her as the daughter then. The daughter, yes. Great looking kid. Yeah, thanks. Um. Okay. So anyway, that's that's something else, and, and there's some. Um, you wait five minutes. I'll be done with a little, little bit. Okay. A little bit. A little bit. <clears throat> Sorry. Spring break here. Oh, nice. Yeah. That's great. And there's, a, there's another uh, colleague that uh, Georg and I have. Um, her name is Malvika Rao. Oh, yeah. I know Malvika. Okay. I met Malvika once in a conference call when Georg was starting the bug, bug mark. Okay, right. right. Yeah. So, um, so I've been talking with her, and uh, so she's interested in being part of this interview process, and um, she may not appear on these Friday calls, but but she'll be another person who will be part of that. Good. And maybe there's other people, you know, as, as we go along, maybe we'll find, maybe we'll find other people who are also interested. And one of the things we will do at some point is, is put out a call for, um, uh, nominations for for you know for contacts for this interview process so we'd, we'd like to get into um, open source program offices you know at Microsoft IBM uh, you name it you know uh, so we'll we'll be asking people to step forward uh, over the next few months yeah I think, I think, you know, recruiting people into the working group, even if they participate in the list and not on the calls, I think is incredibly valuable. Yeah. Um, and I think Matt's doing some work with the chaos website to make it a little bit more clear. Okay. I want to contribute a metric or an idea for a metric. How do I do that? Yeah. Um, because I, you know, I've had several conversations with Augur contributors who have got this idea. I want to do this metric. Mm -hmm. And it takes a good deal of chat back and forth to, help them understand how do I, how do they do that? Right. You know, and it's, it's, once you see it, it's pretty easy. You fork a repo, you add stuff, you do a pull request. And I think it's the navigation to what is the stuff I add and what is the format and where is that, um, that we're going to make a little bit more transparent through Matt's, Matt's efforts at improving the new newcomer experience for chaos. Yeah. That's awesome. Well, uh, you know, I think you guys have done a marvelous job uh, setting up a, a framework. And, um, you know, I feel like I've been able to connect and be really productive quickly. So that, that's nice. That's great. That's, that's good to hear. It's good to hear. And if yeah. you have specific suggestions for ways that would make Augur or Grimoire Lab or Percival easier to navigate, I encourage you to create issues in those repos as well. Okay. Just say, hey, I was a newcomer and I stumbled on this or why can't it do this? Um, I think, I don't think any of us have ego wrapped up in it. We mm -hmm. like to hear what's not working for someone who's actually loaded the stuff and tried it out and found it lacking. Like I, yeah. I hear at a chaos level that it's just a bunch of discontinuous tools. <laughs> yeah. Um, hmm. So, so I will do that, and I'll just say my number one, you know, if you can find somebody who just makes it their job to, to figure out how to make all of these tools consumable, that'd be a great role for somebody. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, uh, you know, doing it through, like, that might be a really nice, like, Google Summer of Code, if you've, if you've got some people who are coming in for that. I've got one person interested in Augur, so 
um, maybe I could direct them toward that experience thing. Maybe. But uh, but I like what I've seen. It's really cool. I mean, it's really a, really a nice, um, you know, kind of. Uh, I mean, there's there's definitely a foundation there to to build on. Good, and we look forward to work building on it with you. Yeah. So let's see. Um, is there anything else we need to chat about before we wrap up? I've got to go in about five minutes. I'm I'm good. I, no, I was just working on my action item. Um, so moving forward, it was always good to remind people that our weekly call is coming up. And so what some working groups have started doing is assigning a facilitator for the next meeting who is responsible for sending out a reminder at least one day in advance. Okay, so why don't I take that on and I'll just do it like forever. Okay, and are we gonna do, are we doing this weekly for value here? I think to get the working group up and running it would be good to do it weekly. Yeah, yeah I'm good with that. I just, I was just asking so I knew. Yeah, and then once we have a good thing going and we have some good metrics, um, we can reduce the frequency later. Sounds good. Okay. And and Georg, you're gonna you're gonna post um, a summary onto the mailing list? Yes, that is the job of the note taker. Okay. <laughs> I will just copy paste the notes that we have taken and post them on the mailing list. Okay. And uh, the the reason why I post a copy of it, not just the link, is so that we have a archived version in the mailing list. Sounds good. Yep. Okay, uh, guys, have a wonderful weekend. Yeah, you too. Um, talk to you guys later. Okay. Bye. Awesome. Bye. Thank you. Bye.